I love eating and I love cooking, but like you, I always feel I'm in a hurry and it can be hard trying to fit everything in. Children, work, family, everything else life throws at you. And I am not prepared to sacrifice a single meal. But I got the answer. In a word, it's express. I'm always rushing about, but I never leave home without food. When I'm on the run, I need to eat. And I promise you that wherever you're going, I have the food parcel for you. For super fast emergency rations on the run, I've got an addictive sesame noodle salad and a velvety pea and pesto soup. I aim to make feeding kids problem free with my express movable feast, buttermilk chicken, nutty coleslaw and Rocky Road Crunch bars. And for a perfectly portable hostess gift, my rapid fire homemade honeycomb, my hokey pokey. This is eating out and about the express way. Trying to get your hair a bit off your face. Okay, in you go. Nice cool. I can never leave the house without something to eat, and actually, this small gap between packing the children off to school and getting on my own way gives me time to make one of my favourite packed lunches. It's some sesame peanut noodles, and let me tell you that whatever your destination, these make a pretty fabulous travelling companion. The thing about these sesame peanut noodles is that they are a doddle to make. I'm going to start off with the dressing. It's a really gungy dressing, it really sticks to the roof of your mouth. I want a tablespoonful of sesame oil, ditto of garlic infused oil, and the same again, a tablespoon or thereabouts, of soy sauce. And about twice that, about two tablespoons each, of lime juice, love this stuff, and sweet chilli sauce. So you can see there's quite a bit of shopping, but I tend to have bottles like this in the house anyway. A little bit of a whisk up. Now actually, this would be fabulous as it is as a dressing, but when it's got about a third of a pot of sweet, salty, smooth peanut butter, well, you're in heaven. I'm going to stir these together so I've got a thick thick sauce that'll coat each strand of noodle. Well, that's the dressing. And now the salad. I use ready-cooked egg noodles, which makes life very easy. And it's not that noodles are hard to cook. I mean, even my children can cook noodles. But if you cook the noodles yourself, you then have to wait for them to get cool. And for me, finding time can be the hardest thing. I want about a handful or so of bean sprouts. A little more than a handful. I've got, I'll do everything I've got. Why not? There's no point wasting those. Some mange too. I don't bother to chop them. Just strew them like this. And then there's only a little bit of chopping. Namely, two spring onions and a red pepper. Let's finely slice the onions. One of the reasons that this makes such a great pat lunch is that it keeps extremely well. Let's finely slice the onions. Pepper. I mean, not that I'm an expert on pat lunches. When I had my first job, I used to make myself a little pat lunch every day, and I'd be sitting in the office and I would be hearing the siren call of my packed lunch under the desk. <laughs> Nearly every day I'd have finished it by 10.30. The idea is that the pepper is in thin strips, but that's only the idea. I love the sweet juiciness of red peppers. I can't have anything to do with someone who likes green peppers, but red, yellow, orange, they are delicious. And now the grand coming together of salad and dressing and let it gloop onto the salad. It's really, I suppose, a sauté sauce. 
for lazy people. This actually is the hardest bit, well for me it is, <laughs> being patient enough to toss everything together so that the thick dressing coats every strand of eggy noodle. And now to enhance the sesame-ness, sesame seeds, about four spoonfuls. Look how beautiful, and I think this really makes it. And on top, I love some fresh coriander. Beautiful. A final comb through, and I've got something to keep me going and I pop out, and a nice vat of noodles to pick at in the fridge. And I never feel happy unless I've got something to pick at in the fridge. Lunch, if it lasts that long. Well, in case you were wondering what time it is, that'll keep me going until lunch anyway. You know, cooking portable food for myself is never going to be difficult because I eat everything. But children are such fussy eaters and it can be really hard cooking for them. I have got notebooks here of everything I've ever cooked, sad but true. And I've got things here that I've cooked for the children when we had to go somewhere. I can't believe I went to this much trouble. You know, I've sieved things, I've set them, I've unmoulded them. Did they eat them? Probably not. And I was probably exhausted afterwards. So now I've wised up a bit and I take the expressway. And the thing about that is, what I'm looking for now are recipes that are simple to cook, easy, 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 and that they love eating. I've planned a picnic for tomorrow. A bit like Samuel Johnson said about second marriages, the triumph of hope over experience. But this is going to be great. I'm starting off by making some Rocky Road Crunch Bars. I've got 300 grams of really good dark chocolate here, broken up into little pieces. And on top of that, 125 grams of soft unsalted butter and three gorgeous golden tablespoons of golden syrup. Just put the heat on and let this melt gently while I get on with putting the crunch into the crunch bars. I do this with 200 grams of rich tea biscuits and then bash. Now the idea is to have a bit of crummage but some rocks too, hence Rocky Road. The chocolate mixture is beautifully melted now. I could dive in, but in fact, what I need to do is remove about 125 millilitres, two small ladlefuls. And now I can add the crunch and a little squidge as well. I've got 100 grams of mini marshmallows. And mix everything together. And then turn the rubble out onto a nine inch square tin. Flatten everything down. And here I dribble over all the reserved chocolate, which will fill in all the gaps and give a beautiful smooth topping. And then tomorrow I can cut this into slices, 24, although I could easily get 48 to be honest and push some snowy icing sugar on top. They'll wolf this down, you know they will. Right, chicken drumsticks. I don't think there's any better picnic food 
than a drumstick or two. Children love being able to eat with their fingers. I've got 12 drumsticks here, and I like to marinate them in buttermilk because it keeps the meat incredibly tender. I want 500 millilitres in here, a tablespoon full of coarse salt, and I want a tablespoon as well of coarse pepper. Maybe this sounds slightly odd, but I am using a tablespoonful of maple syrup. This is not very sweet. It just counters the tang of the buttermilk and just helps the chicken bronze up when it roasts. A teaspoon of ground cumin. I'm going to use my little baby spoon here. And two cloves of garlic. Just bruise them. Just press on top. Add the garlic. And a little bit of vegetable oil. Think of it like moisturiser, about four tablespoons. I often use this marinade for whole spatchcock chickens, which I then portion at the table. But it's just quicker and easier to use drumsticks. Right, so the drumsticks are done, and they'll be ready to be cooked tomorrow. And this is the thing, really. I've got the Rocky Road setting in the fridge, these marinading in the fridge. It was ten minutes' work, if that, and I can now go to bed and sleep smugly. I have a spring in my step, which is Quite a proud boast, given that I've got an ever-growing crowd for my picnic later. But the thing is, this is all so easy. I'm taking the chicken drumsticks out of the buttermilk marinade, where they've been tenderising overnight. I know that raw chicken doesn't win any beauty competition, but you wait till these are roasted, golden and gorgeous. A little bit of oil on top to help them bronze up. About two spoonfuls. And then while these roast, I can get on with the buttermilk and pecan coleslaw that's to go with. Coleslaw may seem an obvious accompaniment to any picnic, but my coleslaw is slightly different. I use spring onions for, instead of regular round onions, and I do so partly because it's a lot easier, but also because I think the acrid taste of onions in a coleslaw ruins it, and children don't like it either. I'm going to peel these two carrots. They can be grated in the processor, along with two sticks of celery and a head of cabbage. So I'm just chopping the celery, and I'll chop the cabbage too, to prepare them for their untimely end in the processor. I've used a regular pointed cabbage here, but you could just as easily use an ordinary round white cabbage or a savoy cabbage. All are good. That's the cabbage and celery. Very satisfying, all that chopping, with so little effort. A couple of carrots and we're away. Right, that's it. I'm going to strew the carrots colourfully over the cabbage and celery and I think it's easier just to mix by hand before the dressing goes on, and it's the dressing that really makes this. I hate it when coleslaw comes in a really rich dressing, so although I'm using 200 grams of mayonnaise, and I do think it's worth getting a good organic one, I'm adding buttermilk just to add a bit of lightness and sharpness. So in goes the mayo, in with four tablespoonfuls of buttermilk. I had it left over from yesterday. You can use yoghurt if you want. 
This is a pecan coleslaw and maple syrup always partners pecans beautifully. Don't be alarmed because although I know there are two tablespoonfuls of maple syrup going in, it doesn't add sugariness, just great depth and a sort of smoky sweetness. And because I want a little more lightness in the dressing, both in terms of consistency and taste, I'm adding two teaspoons of cider vinegar. I love its apple tang. And now a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And I can whisk up and pour it over the coleslaw. Mm, serenely pale, this dressing. But it's got a real oomph when you taste it. Mix well. You want everything very lightly glossed in this dressing. You'd be amazed how much of this children really munch down. It's wonderful. And I promise you, I couldn't get my children to eat cooked cabbage. I promised you a pecan coleslaw, and I deliver. Got 100 grams of pecans here. And the reason I'm chopping them by hand and not in the processor is I only want them roughly chopped. It would be disastrous if they were to be ground because it's their gorgeous crunch which really makes the difference. I'm just going to toss everything together. And that's it. I've got a few things to do. Chicken out of the oven, Rocky Road out of the fridge, get some boxes and pack up and then I can go out and play. I so much prefer using these brown paper boxes rather than a lot of plastic. I mean, just because it's a picnic doesn't all have to be garish and plasticky. Ah, perfect. So the Rocky Road Crunch is set overnight just to perfection. I am now going to slice and turn this into bars. And then I'll give a final beautiful dusting of icing sugar. Not the handiest of picnic boxes, I'll admit, but I love it. It comes from a 1960s camper van. The Rocky Road, the coleslaw and chicken. My stripy bag for my odds and ends. Cutlery, plates. That's the thing about picnics, always a lot of carrying. But now the hard work. I'm going to go and try and round up the children. So, how many of them are going to end up in the water, do you think? <laughs> OK, I'm going to unpack my wares. Right. I feel like a dinner lady. Thank you. There you are. Okay, Charlie. There you are. Righty ho. Nice position here. Great. It's a safe distance from the children. <laughs> I love spicy stuff. It's not that spicy. It's not spicy at all. Spicy when you say spice, there isn't a spice. You did it last night. I did it. Bruno, I need you to be a waiter.
I've never made any secret of the fact that I won't leave home without a meal on me, but the truth is a bit worse than that. I mean, what happens if I get hungry in between meals? So I've got a pea and pesto soup that instantly fills the gaps. And the fabulous thing is, I mean, it couldn't be simpler to make. I start off with three quarters of a litre of boiling water. And I want about half a teaspoon of salt. And what's so lovely about this soup is really with a clutch of standby ingredients, I've got the wherewithal to keep a flask of something hot and filling about my person all day. And I want 375 grams of peas. I want a squirt, about half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of lime juice. And I like this because I think it gives a little prick of taste to the soup. It also helps the green peas stay greener than you can imagine. I take two spring onions and I immerse them in the water. And then when everything's cooked, I remove them, by which time all their sweet onioniness will have gone straight into the soup. Couldn't really be any easier. Right, heat on, and it's really a matter of moments before the soup is cooked. As soon as the peas are tender, the soup is ready by the blending. When I go to restaurants, I like to order something to pick at while I contemplate the menu and order for real. And I feel a bit like that about the soup. It just keeps me going while I decide what to have for my next meal. Perfect. We appear to be bang on target for an onion retrieval operation. There they are. Here's one. Looks rather sad. I have drained the lifeblood from it. And the other. And now, with the aid of a little pesto, I will turn this into a Kermit coloured puree. You can use pesto out of a jar, but the fresh pesto, or so-called fresh pesto, that you get in tubs from the chiller cabinet in supermarkets is much more intense in flavour and in colour. Four tablespoonfuls of that go in. I much prefer blending soups rather than blitzing them in a processor, and it does help if the lid has a central part that comes out. It means you don't get that pressure from the heat, and you're less likely to get splattered with soup. Anyway, I am very clumsy, so I will use a cloth as a precaution. My little babies, prepare to meet your maker. I've got a pretty full-on day today, so this will really keep me going. But you know, I think I need one for the road now. And this must be one of the speediest soups on record. Mmm. Mmm. On with my day. I don't suppose that it's any surprise that when I take a present to someone for a dinner party, I take something edible. And what I love to take is some honeycomb. I call it by the Cornish name, hokey pokey. I want some golden syrup, of course I do. I want sugar and I want bicarb. And it's the bicarb that creates all those lovely crunchy bubbles. And the thing is, this isn't just cooking. This is kitchen alchemy. Three ingredients and only three ingredients but they create something when well, I find it very exciting anyway. I want 100 grams of caster sugar. Ingredient two, four tablespoonfuls of golden syrup. I like to stir these two ingredients together now because I don't think it's good to stir once heat is applied. Makes it go gritty. And heat is going to be applied and a lot of it. In a few moments, what will happen is that the sugar and syrup will fuse together and melt to become a molten pan full of golden caramel. 
One of the reasons I like taking this, apart from the fact that it's really quick to make, is that it's very personal. And anyway, my mother always told me, do not take flowers when you go to people's houses for dinner, because then they've got to go and find a vase. I'm going to indulge myself with a bit of a swirl. Stirring is not good, but swirling is permitted. OK, we are now about to hit ingredient three, but I'm going to turn the heat off first. Ingredient three is one and a half teaspoons of bicarb. And whisk in, and you can see it's this golden, foamy cloud that just needs to be poured out. Look at that. And it'll set within 50 minutes, which gives me more than enough time to get ready. Well, I'm ready. Mm, the hokey pokey is ready. So we can go out for dinner now. Now first, I want to break the hokey pokey into luscious shards, and here goes. I like some to be like gold dust, and some bits still to be quite large and biteable. I'm inhaling this honeycomb dust as I do this, it's rather fabulous. I don't really need to present this in anything to make it look more beautiful, but I think it's just as well to put it in a tin so I don't eat it all before I get there. It's like putting golden nuggets inside a jewellery casket. Final sprinkling of gold dust. I know it's awful. I would so much rather stay in just me and the hokey pokey than go out and have to give it away. I've never been good at self-discipline, that's no surprise. Hello. Hello, darling. Now listen, I've got a confession to make. Yeah. I made you something sweet for us all to have. I thought how nice with coffee after dinner. This night I ate most of it in the cab on the way here. Sorry.